my grandma would say that. Um, yeah. Let's uh, let's get things started. Um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I want to make sure to try to have enough time to adequately cover this. Um, uh, I want you to know that I love all of you, and I desperately hope that uh, you love me after all this is said and done. So uh, we'll nope. see what happens. Um, oh, one more. Um, hey, also as usual. Um, there's a lady at this church that all of you know named Marty. Marty is um, very particular about having the attendance done. So I'm going to start over here with Allison. And uh, as the attendance goes to each of the tables, please mark an X in the column of October 10th by your name. So I can avoid the wrath of Marty next week. So there we go. So we don't do it. <laughs> if you don't do it. That, 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 would be, that would be a passive-aggressive way to uh, express how you feel about today's topic. So, um, is your husband coming down here? I'm here. Okay, there he is. Sleep too. All right. Hey, um, let's, uh, let's open in prayer, and uh, then I'm going to actually have somebody jump right into uh, reading the passage that the core of this uh, equipping hour is kind of built around and... We'll go from there. Um, let's see. Uh, most sanctified pray. Um, Mr. Hobbins, go for it. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come here as family, as friends, and just to, to seek you after you, and, Lord, to learn more about all that you are and, and Lord, your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity here, Lord. We look up those who are unable to be here, Lord, for those who are healing, and, and Lord, just uh, ask your blessing upon them. All right. Okay. So, um, if you remember all the way back to that video that was uh, recorded with those three amazing actors um, that was preview for this class, um, we talked about how myself, Brian, and Pastor Jerry hold um, each hold one of the three views about the millennium. Now, it can be easy to misrepresent the and apply those, say that they, those views apply to the whole of Revelation, but they don't. And that's what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, how when you're talking about viewing Revelation, there's actually four views. Um, the uh, futurist view, the preterist view, the historicist view, and the spiritualist view. But when you get down to Revelation 20, those views don't necessarily um, play into how historically the church has looked at uh, the topic of the millennium. And that really is the focus of this equipping hour, is Revelation 20. Although those views we talked about a couple of weeks ago will come into play. Um, I know, Brian, you're going to hit on one of them, especially with your view next week. Mm -hmm. But I won't, I won't spoil that. Um, however, here's what I thought would be good. Um, since the remaining lessons here are going to essentially be uh, asking the question, how do we look at Revelation 20? I thought it would be a good idea if we started off by actually having somebody read Revelation 20. Can I get a volunteer to read Revelation 20 for us, please? This is Van Wert, go for it. Or Dr. Van Wert. Whatever. Much better. Sorry. This is an NIV. Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. This is an NIV. All Revelation 20. Yeah. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the keys to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, who is the devil or Satan, and found him. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first Second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, perhaps? That's a little uh, And to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. The fire came down from heaven and 
devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet have been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. They have a veto tent on. Amen. Uh, well, so um, that's that's going to be the, the core passage that we that we're thinking about as we go through these next few weeks. Um, by means of an opening warm up question, um, I am curious uh, and talk amongst your tables here for a few minutes, and then we'll have uh, some people weigh in um, if you want to, whole group style. Um, but what is your experience, if any, with amillennialism? And uh, without cheating and looking ahead, um, what's your understanding of it? So take yeah, take a few minutes to talk to your table. If you have no idea, there's nothing wrong with saying I have no idea. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's bring it back together here, kids. <laughs> Forgive me if I project onto you uh, so much of the way I feel and the way I act in, uh, in my whole time job. Anyway, um, okay, hey, um, could we have one or two people share any, any if anything, that uh, you know or have an understanding of with regards to uh, millennialism? Yep. And mill means a thousand. Yeah. Oh, we were right. So yeah. <laughs> so that what that term means is not a thousand. And so we think that they don't believe in a literal thousand. Right. Year. 
if you just look at the construction of the word, yes, that's. But the first sentence of our definition in section one is going to talk about that. So I'm going to assume you guys didn't cheat. No, we didn't. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm working on that. I really don't have a whole lot of background on millennialism. So it's pre post, pre mid post, and this kind of how it's always been framed up, and that's just the background. So this is not a topic that I've had a lot of experience with. Uh, I kind of stumbled on it. Um, without realizing it um, a number of years ago. So Charles, I was basically in the same boat you were in, so yeah. Um, you know, we should probably take a moment to define the millennium. Here's, here's a joke. All right. Okay, um, a basic, a basic uh, definition of the millennium is a thousand years of heavenly peace that Christians fight over. <laughs> I saw that from that video. Yeah. So, so we're gonna we're gonna try our best not to uh, get to, to fighting, but you know, we'll see. yeah, Jerry. Amillennialism pairs with the preterist view. Uh, for those of us who grew up with the preterist view, we also grew up with the amillennial view. Uh, a thousand years is is a metaphorical period of, of a, a long time, mm -hmm. and the preterist view of most of these things, revelations, have already occurred and, and, and goes along with also this, this uh, millennial view that we are in the current, we're in that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is all built up to the, to the coming back, to the so, return. So I agree with all that. I'm going to correct one thing. Yes, the preterist view of revelation as a whole does feed into uh, an amillennial view, but it's not the only view that feeds into it. And uh, I don't know if you look. You didn't look on page two, did you? No, I haven't. Heard of okay, good. good, good. <laughs> so anyway, well, hey, listen. Um, if you have some experience or no experience, what I hope to do here today is number one, like give you a basic framework for what it is. Um, please understand that this is not a uh, master's degree in theology uh, course. Um, this is purely a layman giving you what I uh, know. So there's a real good chance you may have questions that I might have a hard time answering. Um, the one thing I appreciate is um, Brian and Pastor Jerry, um, you know, just helping me out as I put this together. And quite frankly, I appreciate that the trained theologian that is part of our group of three is actually not here to throw me under the bus. So, <laughs> so this is a this is a good environment for me to um, to present this. Um, all right. Well, let's let's define it. Section number one: amillennialism. If you break the word down, ah, and millennial. Um, means no millennium, literally speaking. However, um, it is not entirely accurate definition. Rather, all millennialists believe that the millennium spoken of in Revelation 20 is symbolic. Symbolic is that first blank. The reign of the saints during the millennium depicts either the vindicated martyrs reigning from heaven in the present age, or earthly believers achieving spiritual victory over personal sin during the same period of time. The time frame of the millennium is seen to be the whole of time between Christ's first and second advents. Thus, the binding of Satan at the beginning of the millennium is associated with the first coming of Christ, and the fire from heaven at the end of the millennium is associated with his second coming. Now, just a uh, couple of quick bullet points. Um, first one, the binding of Satan represents victory of Christ over the powers of darkness accomplished at the cross. You get you'll, you'll get one of these, uh, Doctor Edward. I keep trying. Get an eater eater. Uh, next bullet. The thousand years is symbolic of a long indeterminate period, corresponding to the age of the church. Um, and if you want, like I know it's a meme, and you always got to be careful at using satire to uh, communicate uh, theological concepts. But the meme up at the top does a pretty good job of comparing um, the pre-mill view, which Pastor Jerry will talk about in a couple of weeks, versus the uh, amillennial view down below. And it's actually not too far off from the post-mill view either, Brian. No. So, um, yeah, if you want to, if you're a visual learner like myself, take a look up there. That's a pretty good comparison. <laughs> visual learner, right? You got it. Old people in this room that can really see that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to let Pastor Jerry defend the top uh, diagram, so we'll just we'll wait for that. Anyway, yeah, I, I, Miriam, I sat and laughed for probably about 10 minutes straight when I found this so I had to put it in here. So, 
All right, next bullet point. Satan will be loose briefly to wreak havoc and to persecute the church at the end of the present age. Fourth bullet point, the fire coming from heaven and consuming the wicked is symbolic of Christ's second coming. Fifth bullet point, a general resurrection and judgment of evil and the good will of, of evil and the good will occur at Christ's coming, followed by the creation of new heavens and new earth. Okay, that's that is broad strokes what our millennialists believe. Um, top of page two. Oh, question? Yeah. Go for it. Where does the rapture fit in that? Uh, the rapture and Christ's second coming are seen as one and the same. Okay. And all yeah, the, so they would say that Christ comes twice, not three times. Correct. Right. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. Right. Uh, and I'll and I will make um, the case for that in section two a little okay. bit more. So um, important things to note. Top of page two. Uh, as we talked about earlier, and Jerry brought up. Um, we have these four views that are broadly group people, uh, people's view of Revelation as a whole. However, um, none of them exclusively align to any of the three millennial views. And that was one of the like crazy things in studying this. I didn't realize how kind of like, if you're like me, you tend to like things in nice clean boxes. You know, where you can clearly say, like, this is one group, this is another group, and this is another. Well, then when you start mixing it all together, it's like, holy smokes, like, these are, these are not clean boxes at all. Um, and so uh, if you find yourself, like, having one view of the millennium, hopefully, hopefully the amillennial view after we're done. Um, if you find yourself having one view of the millennium, but, you know, a different view of Revelation as a whole, as compared to the person you're sitting next to, you're normal. Like, that is... That is totally to be expected, and quite frankly, throughout church history, that's really where uh, the church fathers really kind of, uh, you know, sorted out themselves. So that leads me to the second important detail: um, church theologians um, who were amillennialists. Uh, a guy named Saint Augustine. <clears throat> uh, this guy you guys may have heard of, named Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a historist amillennialist. Uh, Jay Adams was a preterist amillennialist. William Hendrickson was a spiritualist uh, amillennialist, and Abraham Kuyper, a futurist amillennialist. So once again, uh, the way you view Revelation doesn't necessarily filter you into one particular view of the millennium. Uh, so what I'll be curious to see, especially after um, we're all done with this, is where you guys feel you sort out at. So, All right, so this is probably a crazy view to some of you. Um, so let me uh, do my best to make my case for it. Uh, Roman numeral number two, arguing for the millennial, the amillennial peace. Number one, um, the first thing to consider when uh, thinking about the amillennial view, the literary style of revelation, um, apocalyptic literature. <laughs> Should just shout it out. Apocalyptic literature. Uh, the bulk of this lesson came from this book, which again I will. Uh, uh, claim validity for because it is in our church library. So it's not some crazy like off the internet book that five people own. Like we actually own this. So and one, one thing that's really nice about I and I have the one from the library. <laughs> in case you're looking for it, uh, is that maybe I said this last time, but uh, the guy that edited this, Keith Gregg, he he does a really good job of I guess not being biased yeah. in any of the views. So. If you have a certain view, you can pick this up and not feel like he's cutting down one of the views. So it, it really is a nice, uh, I, I feel unbiased look at all the four views, as, as well as the three millennial views, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, and without getting into the format of the book, um, it, it, that, that's how it's set up. But yeah, so good point. All right. Uh, so from that, well, actually, this is sentence I put together. So if it's done poorly, don't blame the book. Um, how we interpret passages of scripture are based in part on the literary style, aka genre, of the book that the passage is written in. For example, the way we interpret passages from Deuteronomy, which is essentially a legal treaty, um, versus Psalms, which is composed um, primary or not primarily, but uh, mostly of poetry, versus Revelation, apocalyptic narrative, differs based on each of their respective books' literary styles. And I think that's kind of a minimal starting point for looking at uh, where you fall in terms of the millennial view. Um, 
please take into account that we don't read all scripture the same. How it's written plays into how we interpret it. Okay. Oh, yes. Do you have a question? Just the glasses up. Okay. <laughs> just like my, just like your glasses. Yeah, just like my students at school, like they'll be up like fixing their hair or something, and I'll be like, yes, and like I don't have a question, Mr. Carl. It's like, stop it. <laughs> hey, uh, next next paragraph. This is actually from my book. Apocalyptic literature is a special special kind of writing that arose among Jews and Christians to reveal certain mysteries about heaven and earth, humankind and God, angels and demons, the life of the world today and the world to come. No other book of the New Testament is written in this style, but between 200 BC and 180, Jewish writers produce a large number of non-canonical, by non-canonical uh, meaning not in the Bible, non-canonical books, which because of their similarities to this book are now referred to as apocalyptic. And uh, some of those books, um, Dr. Van Wert referenced last week. Um, you can see them there in the parentheses. Um, yeah, so I can just read those on your own. Um, next, another obvious similarity between Revelation and its uninspired counterparts is the use of vivid images and symbols. Vivid images and symbols. Monsters and dragons, symbolic numbers and names, etc. In depicting the conflict between good and evil. A failure to take full account of this feature has led to some of the most outlandish teachings on this book by some whose rule of interpretation is literal unless absurd. Though this is a good rule when dealing with literature written in a literal genre, it is it is the exact opposite in the case of apocalyptic literature, where symbolism is the rule and literalism is the exception. Um, it doesn't take, uh, well, basically getting beyond chapter 3 in Revelation to see very quickly that there's a whole ton of symbolism in there. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that phrase of looking at a, a book that's written in an apocalyptic literature style um, Having as your filter to think symbolism first, um, literal second, I would argue is, is the proper way to look at Revelation. Next, last paragraph at the bottom of that page. In Revelation, personal and national entities are portrayed as animals. For example, a lamb, a dragon, monstrous beasts, mutant locusts, etc. Two cities, symbolically depicted as a harlot and a bride respectively, are given symbolic names like Babylon, Sodom, and Egypt, and Jerusalem. A woman, apparently, is symbolically called Jezebel. Political upheaval, upheavals are symbolically described in terms of cosmic disruptions, the sun and the moon darken, stars falling, every island and mountain disappearing, etc. So that I put that line, that paragraph in there because. It's just so rich in symbolism, and uh, even you know Pastor Jerry and the premillennial view, which I imagine is probably the view held by most of you. You're in a position of premillennial view where you have to interpret these symbols some way or another. So the fact that it's heavily symbolic, I, I don't think is a point that I'll have to belabor too much more. Before I go to the next section, any comments or questions? All right, let's move on. We got one. Oh, yeah. What was that statement you made right before you read that paragraph? Um, uh, I was basically rephrasing the last part of the third paragraph. I'll, I'll read it from here because it's stated better here anyway. Um, uh, where the, where's that sentence? Stop. Um, Though this is a good rule, oh, well, I'll back to the sentence. A failure to take full account of this feature, meaning that it's symbolic, has led to some of the most outlandish teachings on this book by some. Uh, whose rule of interpretation is literal unless absurd. Though this is a good, good rule when dealing with literature written in a literal genre, it is the exact opposite in the case of apocalyptic literature, where symbolism is the rule and literalism the exception. I don't see anything being thrown up this direction. That's good. So let's move on. So the second point I want to make... <laughs> Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you for that.
Um, it will come back to you tenfold next week. So, I'll get to <laughs> Top of page three. So, uh, another thing I would, uh, I would argue for uh, the amillennial view is structural parallelism in Revelation. Meaning, not necessarily in, Dr. Van Wert? Chronological order. Chronological order, yes. <laughs> Top of page three, chronological order. Chronological order. No, but when, when you're trying to minimize the uh, number of pages that your lesson is, sometimes the size of the blanks are proportional. So, um, hey, just, I'm sure every one of you probably know this, but for people seeing out the audience who would have been like me and been like, chronological, I would look that up. What's chronological mean? Time. Time. Well, not just time, but sequential time. Yeah, chronological order meaning sequential time. Okay. From Steve Gray, what, what are we to make of the sequence of chapters in Revelation? How are they organized? There is no reason to insist on a strictly chronological sequence to the unfolding of the events predicted in Revelation, though some approaches have a tendency to assume such a sequence. It should be remembered that when John says, quote, after these things I saw, excuse me, as he frequently does, he is giving us the sequence in which he saw the visions not necessarily implying anything about the chronological order uh, in which the visions in which the visions would find fulfillment in events. A certain amount of parallelism is to be observed in Revelation, regardless of which of the four approaches one takes. That is, some portions double back to cover the same ground um, as was covered in previous sections. Scholars do not agree as to how many parallel sections are present, and that's, uh, that's an important note to end that part on. Um, if Pastor Jerry were here, he would point out how in the pre-millennial view, again, the view that I'm sure most of you probably grew up in, um, there are portages, port, portages, <laughs> portages, <laughs> port, port, portions, Portions of Revelation that cover back over the same um, series of events. Um, so it's not a strict linear chronological presentation um, of the orders um, of the end times. So uh, next, many examples point to the likelihood of parallelism. Parallelism in Revelation. For example, three different passages describe a battle. Uh, Revelation 16, 14, 19, 19, 28. Uh, it is possible that the same battle is in view in each case. Now, again, let me just emphasize the word, it is possible. Um, as I continue through this, please understand that I'm not up here saying that this is the correct view and you are a terrible human being um, if you don't hold this view. I'm just saying that it's a possible explanation. Continuing on, the meaning of three and a half years occurs five times, probably referring to, probably referring in each case to the same period. There's no question that chapter 12 has at least two parallel segments, um, verse 6 and then verses 13 through 17. Um, so a general idea of what parallelism is when you see um, a singular idea represented in different ways in the same book, or in some cases within the same chapter. Um, actually, I can't remember if I put this in. I don't think I put this in the notes, but for those of you whose mind at some point has gone back to the book of Daniel, um, Daniel has the same concept of parallelism too. Um, Daniel has um, two visions about the, uh, the, the forthcoming major kingdoms of the world. First described in a vision about what? Daniel 2. The statues, yeah. The statues lay out the succession of the next kingdoms, but then later on, I think it's Daniel 7? No. Whatever. It's like the second to last chapter of Daniel. He has, he has what, Mrs. Carl? Animals. Yeah, animals um, that communicate the same thing that he was talking about with the uh, vision of the statue. Like animals that talk. 
This, uh, this is not a C.S. Lewis class. I know I uh, <laughs> define myself. Images of animals. <laughs> uh, I, I define myself in those uh, terms, but we're not doing Lewis here. So anyway, my point is simply this. This concept of parallelism is not this you know, crazy off the reservation idea. Um, we see it even going back in Daniel. And, and I would argue probably Daniel is a pretty universal place where we can find agreement um, that those two visions are both talking about the same thing. Okay. Questions? Next, the implication of these parallels affect one's chronological placement. For example, of the thousand years or the millennium. If the events of Revelation 20 must follow the events described in chapter 19, where many interpretations find the second coming of Christ, then the millennium in chapter 20 must come after the second coming of Christ. This is no doubt one of the premillennialist significant assumptions. But if the second coming is seen in chapter if the second coming is seen in chapter 19 and chapter 20 doubles back to start a new parallel section over the same event, then one might see the binding of Satan uh, at the beginning of the gospel age, as does the uh, millennialist. There are additional indicators that the details of Revelation do not necessarily follow one another chronologically. For example, the beast persecutes two witnesses uh, in chapter 11 of Revelation before he rises to power uh, in chapter 13. And Babylon has fallen in chapter 14, but later not yet fallen in chapter 17 and 18. These data seem to be equally problematic for any interpretation that looks for chronologically sequential fulfillments. Okay. Let me get, get on to the next point. The next point is really kind of the defining the defining element of uh, the view that I hold. Uh, number three, Old Testament imagery and revelation, interpreting symbols and imagery. Interpreting symbols and imagery. Um, this next quote is from another book that um, really was influential in kind of me formulating the view that I hold. Now that's part of the Lost Divine series, right? That is not part of the Lost Divine series. Is it series. No, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Um, here we go. Uh, second to last paragraph at the bottom. Revelation is an apocalypse, not just in the sense of an unveiling, but in the sense of what might be uh, described as a language system or matrix that is deeply embedded in Old Testament canon. Then, uh, down at the bottom of page three, those scholars debate the degree to which Revelation may have been influenced by non-canonical writings. There is little question that the Apocalypse contains recycled materials previously employed in other canonical books. The symbols of the Book of Revelation are not generally novel or new, most of them having previously been introduced in other portions of Scripture. The book has been called, quote, a rebirth of images, since it takes images familiar from, top of page four, hundreds. The blank at the top of page four hundreds of Old Testament passages and reworks them into new applications. Unlike most other books of the New Testament, Revelation does not contain one direct quotation from the Old Testament. However, there are hundreds of allusions um, to familiar images and phrases from the Old Testament and from the New Testament as well. Interestingly, especially from the Gospel of John, which would make sense if John's the author of both. It has been calculated that concepts and imagery are drawn from Isaiah 79 times, Daniel 53 times, Ezekiel 48 times, Psalms 43 times, Exodus 27 times, Jeremiah 22 times, Zechariah 15 times, Amos 9 times, Joel 8 times. The principal historical matrices from which the images frequently are taken um, could be grouped uh, first from the Exodus, second from the Babylonian exile, and then third from the life of Christ. And, uh, and I remember particularly in this book, now I'm not going to get into it in this lesson, I'm going to save that for Brian, but um, whenever you talk about eschatology, you really can't have a discussion without bringing in the Olivet Discourse um, from Matthew, was that 24? 
Yeah, yeah the Olivet Discourse. And um, uh, the author of this book, A Bible Teacher Named Hank Hanegraaff, um, pointed out to me, or pointed out in his book specifically, um, how the uh, concept where Jesus talks about coming on clouds has its interpretation rooted in the phrase uh, of what the cloud imagery was in the Old Testament. And that just kind of blew my mind wide open. And from there, going over to Revelation, looking at it with fresh eyes through the matrix of the Old Testament, it's like, holy smokes, like there is so much Old Testament imagery here. Like, it, it just, if I wasn't convinced before seeing the Old Testament through the lens of the Old, seeing Revelation through the lens of the Old Testament, I absolutely was after I started to look at it through through that perspective. So, and then number four, and then we'll actually get to uh, some talk time here. The meaning of a thousand. The meaning of a thousand. This is actually a pretty good example of how uh, using um, the Old Testament to read Revelation is foundational for this view. Here we go. That this period is referred to as a thousand years needs to get, needs give us no trouble, even though the actual age of the church has by this time run nearly twice this length of time. There is nothing surprising in finding the use of symbolic of a symbolic number here, as elsewhere in Revelation. The number a thousand is frequently used in Scripture without the intention of conveying statistical information. It is given as the number of generations. It is given as the number of generations to which God keeps his covenants. Uh, and you can find that in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 7. Uh, does anyone want to roughly quote it from memory? Get bonus points here. God keeps his promises to a thousand generations. The way out, what, what I'm talking, was that? For those who, yeah, correct, in this full context. I'm focusing just on the thousand part. When I'm talking with uh, friends of mine one-on-one, -on -one, especially when we're a little bit more snarky, I'll be like, what? Is that passage saying, like, okay, as long as you're up through generation 1,000 past this person who obeyed, you're good. But generation 1,001, you're done. Like, God's cutting you off. Is that is that really what that passage is communicating? Yeah. I, well, you're, you're, that, that you're, you, need to, you need to make that point two weeks from now. Okay. Well, but Pat, year, he yeah, also says that a thousand, or a day can be like a thousand years to him, and we know that he's eternal. Hey, hey so. you're, you're jumping ahead of me here. Oh. Yeah, just wait. I'm getting there. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting there. Just hold on. I'll be your substitute. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the problem. That's a problem being with a, a, a wonderful group like y'all who know their Bible. Because you're thinking, if you're thinking down the road of where I'm trying to lead you guys, hey, bravo. That's a credit to you guys. Can yeah. I stop you for just a minute there? We, we shouldn't um, be surprised that there's a symbolic period of time, because I'm not really going to use a whole minute here. Oh, wait, what, what was that again? Uh, I said, can I stop you for a minute? And I said, I'm not going to use a whole minute. Uh, <laughs> and we say this all the time. It's part of our regular lingo. Uh, and, and there's the other kid in class who, uh, who picks up on the concept and then turns it back on the teacher. So uh, oh, he's got you have a stick for that, Jerry. Yeah. Hey, real quick, too, uh, just, just be thinking of questions that you guys have, because I, I believe the last week, maybe the last two weeks. No, the last week. Last week, okay. Yeah. And I think we'll maybe provide a way that you guys can... Well, you, guys, to, well, you might not want to suggest that if there's not a there's chance you might not do it like that. So. What? Okay. Yeah, things are kind of cool right now, because uh, Pastor Jerry, with his knee surgery, that was kind of uh, abrupt with, with that planning, so it's kind of change our schedule a little bit as a class. So, well, I, I think regardless, submit your questions to, to us because I, I think it's important. We'll, we'll try to answer them because I, I think that's a big part of this class. Yeah, the, the very last, so next week is Brian, the week after that's Pastor Jerry, and then the week after that is just basically an open Q&A towards all of us. We'll all be up here maybe on stools or something and you can just... I thought the last week you are going to tell us the right answer for all of us. <laughs> well, well, that's who that's who told you the right answer now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but, <laughs> anyway, okay, to, back to uh, this point. Um, the number of hills upon which God owns the cattle. cattle. Again, when I'm in my conversation with friends in a snarky sort of way, I say to them, what? So let's count out a thousand hills. God owns the cattle on those hills, but not hill 1001. Like, is that what that's intended to communicate? <coughs> so, 
Furthermore, the expression 1,000 years is never used elsewhere in scripture for an actual number of years, but only to suggest an idea of a very long time. Reference yeah. Psalms 90, verse 4, Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 6, 2 Peter, Janelle, 3, verse 8. Um, and I remember a, a number of writers making this point, and, uh, and, and that really just, again, sealed the deal for me. Like, I, I, it was at that point where it's like, okay, how is 1,000 used in Scripture? And with a, with a book like Revelation that is so jam-packed with Old Testament imagery, you know, is, is interpreting the millennium in Revelation 20 really the best way to interpret it? Okay, so there's four points that, that I'm using to argue for this view. It's apocalypse, Revelation's apocalyptic literature, the presence of parallelism in it, the heavy use of Old Testament imagery, and the meaning of uh, 1,000. That's a lot of ground. Questions? Yes? <laughs> Fixing the glasses again. Uh, I didn't have a question. Well, the, the, I don't see how the, the thousand holds water because you're saying there's no millennial, like the rapture happened at the same time, there's no millennial, but a thousand indicates, as your point was making, more than, not none. The, the, the amillennial view is not the belief that there's no millennium, it's that we're living in it now. So there is a millennium. We're in it. Yeah, and, and it's, again, as looking back to how a thousand was used in the Old Testament to represent a really big amount of time, that's the case the amillennialists would make, is that you know the millennium we're living in now is not literally a thousand years, but an extended amount of time. So, uh, look back, if you want... Um, I would recommend going back to that first definition there to kind of unpack exactly what the amillennials hold. Yes, question. Yeah, I, I'm confused here. If we're living in it now, yep. and Jesus has already found the devil mm -hmm. for our thousand years or however long, yep. and so the devil's not working in the earth right now, and he's found, why do we still have all the things, the abortions, the, the gay community, the... The, it's okay, do what you want. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Don't read your Bible. Don't go to church. Why are we having that if the devil's not working in our in our world? Right Does now? Revelation say he's locked away where he has no influence? Well, it says he's locked away, he's bound, he's put chained, and he's put where he he's cannot do anything to the earth. In the the amillennialist interprets that this way. Basically, the devil, being that he is chained, he's not locked away permanently where he has zero influence. He's he's limited. Like, when you see that idea of a chain, like, that's not somebody who can't kind of extend out the length of the chain but no further. But essentially, Christ, when he rose from the dead, put that limitation on the devil so that he cannot ultimately obstruct the advancement of the gospel. And so, so yeah, it, again, it's, it's a symbolic way of looking at it, for sure. Um, but... Uh, if Pastor Jerry were here, he would say something along these lines to start off the class. He would say something like, the, the reality is that all three of these views have, have their problems. The ultimate question is, what do you, what, which problems are you most comfortable with? And actually, <laughs> one of the points that I'm going to make kind of addresses that. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to say just that much right now, and then under Roman numeral number three, I'll, I'll finish up what I want to say. No, good question. Well, yeah, go on. <laughs> but is it during the millennium that the ass is supposed to be, be able to lay down with the lamb and, you know, some of those kinds of things taking place? So that's not happening right now. Uh, well, I, the amillennialists would argue that that is happening um, with the saints who are in heaven with Christ right now. They're ruling with him from there. And that there will be an ultimate fulfillment. So, okay, let's talk Prophecy 101, Okay. Um, the best example of what I'm going to describe here is the virgin birth. Okay? No doubt all of you are familiar with uh, that prophecy. Back in Isaiah, Isaiah makes a prophecy about the virgin birth. There was an, a fulfillment of that prophecy in Isaiah, correct? Or would you guys like me to go back and read it? We'll go back to it if we have time at the end. Here's my point. There was an immediate fulfillment and then an ultimate fulfillment. 
The, the immediate fulfillment was uh, uh, Isaiah, um, had, what, were they engaged at that point? I'm trying to think. Or, you know what, let me just read it. Let me just read it. Let me just read it. Instead of going impromptu. You know, it's funny, that's one of the prayers I have before I do, before I do these classes. Like, Lord, please keep me from misrepresenting your word. So let's just go right to, what chapter is that? I believe it's chapter 7. Uh, uh, Isaiah 7 is a message seven. today. Seven. Oh, the sign of Emmanuel. Oh, yeah, yeah, ask, ask the Lord your God for a sign. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 7, um, verse 10. Um, this is Isaiah speaking um, to the king. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord uh, God to the test. Or, me, I will not put the Lord to the test, which... I do. I appreciate that response, in all honesty. Um, but nonetheless. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? <clears throat> Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey, and when he knows enough to reject uh, the wrong and choose the right, but before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. Um, but that's pretty good right there. Now, that's an interesting um, word of the Lord to the king, because if that was just purely pointing to Jesus' birth, how would the king have any way to validate whether what the prophet was saying was true or not? He wouldn't. So what we see in prophecy oftentimes is an immediate fulfillment, and then an ultimate fulfillment. Now, where was the immediate fulfillment here? Let's see. Oh, gosh. Hold on. You know what? Just don't this could be a good question maybe to answer at the end of the... Hold on. Right. Just look it up. We can do it real fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about the fulfillment to verse 17? That. 2 Kings 16, 8 through 9. Hold on. No, no, it's in, it's in Isaiah. Is it 8, 3, and 4? Uh, yes, that is it. No. Yes. Um, who, who said that? 8, 3, and 4. Janelle, bravo. Um, I'm going to read uh, starting at 8, verse 1, and then we go down through verse 4. The Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen. Uh, Maher Shalah Hashbaz. Is that, Brian, is that about right? No, perfect. Right, thank you. <laughs> and I will call in uh, Uriah the priest and Zechariah, son of Zedekiah, as reliable witnesses for me. Then I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said to me, Name him Maher Shalah Hashbaz. Before the boy knows how to say, My father, my mother... Uh, the wealth of Damascus and the plunder of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. That is the immediate fulfillment of the virgin birth prophecy. That is the fulfillment that King Ahaz would have recognized to validate um, what Isaiah was saying to him. It's not a virgin birth. Why, okay, so why is it not a virgin birth? 
There was only one. What do you mean? When God did it, there was one virgin that gave birth, and it was to our Savior. It was no so, one else. So the virgin, the virgin, and this is where my the limit of my knowledge goes back. To this, going back to my Old Testament class, and I, Pastor, Pastor Jerry over here, you say the same thing. The Hebrew word for virgin used in Isaiah chapter 7 can mean two things. It can mean somebody like Mary. It can also mean somebody um, to like, uh, I don't know, how do I say that? It, it definitely means somebody like Mary. The question is, uh, was Isaiah uh, married to this prophetess at that time? Had he consummated his marriage to her? And so it was a fulfillment in that uh, Isaiah had not consummated the marriage to the prophetess. And so she was a virgin when uh, the child was conceived. Um, I, I'll let, I'll let, you know what, I, how, can we do this? I'll, I'll have Pastor Jerry come up here whenever he can get back. Yeah. He can he can speak to this more definitively than what I can. I would say go ahead and write that question yeah. down. Yeah. Write that down. Write, write a full question down that way. Yeah. One of us can, you know, in a couple weeks prepare to answer that. Because there, there are a lot of questions that maybe we might not be sure of. Um, well, uh, no, I'm, I'm certain I'm certain that is that is correct. Um, however, my ability to articulate its correctness is clearly less lacking. I, I was in his Old Testament class at college. And I remember our Old Testament teacher telling us this, and I felt the exact same way. I was like, I don't like this. This makes me uncomfortable. There should only be one virgin birth, blah, blah, blah. I felt the exact same way, but it is the held tradition of, of biblical scholars. So, But it's fine to feel weird about it. And yeah. If someone like Pastor Gary can explain it better. Yeah. I'll add, it. I'll add to it too. I learned it at Moody. So, so okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's some online like yeah. seminary course that, yeah, okay, okay. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have Pastor Jerry uh, talk about it. But in general, again, to the bigger point, prophecy tends to have an immediate fulfillment and then an ultimate fulfillment. Hey, Scott. Yeah. Just for the current discussion, mm -hmm. you're not saying that there were two virgin births in the essence that we know virgin with the Christmas story and Mary. Yeah. You're saying the word virgin, mm -hmm. the vernacular, the vocabulary, can have two interpretations in the immediate fulfillment and then in the married fulfillment. Correct. So it's not that there were two virgin births in the way we think of virgin. Yeah. It's that the word virgin can have more than one interpretation. Correct. Thank you. Yes, yes. I get what Heather's saying. I understood that before she said it. But then when you go on and it says that um, the virgin, uh, she will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Mm -hmm. um, and then it goes on from there talking about the child. How does that fit with what you're saying is the fulfillment in chapter eight? The virgin will be the child. Um, like I said, he was not he had not consummated, they had not engaged in no, the conjugal No, I understand life. that. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about his name, God with us, etc. That's where, that's where it's going to take somebody who's a more trained theologian than I to answer that. I pro I'll tell you what, I promise you that is, what I'm communicating is the normal held tradition of the church. I promise you. Um, I would encourage you guys to dig into it on your own. You know, one of the takeaways I hope from this uh, lesson, well, from this whole equipping hour, is that you guys will dig into scripture. You know, so quite frankly, that if you don't have something that's really piqued your interest recently, that might be a good topic to dig into. Um, but I, I don't take it just on authority, but I do promise you that is the uh, the the understanding of, of that passage. So, well, let me br let me bring this on in for a close since we are right at the end. <laughs> um, does Scott actually believe the millennial view? Answer? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, I can't. Where I think what might have been Nancy. I don't know where, where Nancy went, but uh, somebody asked me at the beginning, like, do you really hold this view, or are you just playing devil's advocate? Like, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually persuaded of this view. Then back to your question from earlier. The second bullet under number three, Revelation 20 verses seven through eight. Um, that's the passage that began the process of my migration to amillennialism and was a catalyst pushing me deeper into scripture. 
And what is that passage? You know, I think it's probably worthwhile that, you know, getting some pushback on that virgin birth fulfillment. Because I would push back against the premillennial view about Satan coming back on the scene at the end of the millennium. There's a couple of interpretive principles that are, are important, would fall under broadly under the banner of what we call hermeneutics, the proper way to study scripture. That really I just could not wrap my mind around um, with regards to the idea of Satan being released at the end of this golden era where everything was perfect and then sin being reintroduced back on the scene, which is the premillennial view. The two principles are this, and then I'll explain my problem with it, okay? <laughs> which is funny because we had like probably an hour discussion with Pastor Jerry on Thursday night where he tried to justify it, but... Yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't. Can't, can't give, yeah. I wasn't, wasn't persuaded. But anyway, two two things to consider whenever you're interpreting scripture. Number one, always read scripture in light of scripture. Always read scripture in light of scripture. When you're settling on an interpretation, do you see that concept taught somewhere else in the Bible? Like that's, that's so fundamentally important. Do you see that concept taught somewhere else in the Bible? The other interpretive principle that really moved me in this direction, always interpret the cloudy in light of the clear. Always interpret the cloudy in light of the clear. So when I'm looking at a passage, <laughs> this is, well, oh gosh. Did I talk about prayer Jabez? Maybe. Yeah, are you, anyone familiar with prayer Jabez? Okay, please forgive me if you absolutely love that book. Um, I don't. Um, <laughs> Prayer Jabez was this whole system of blessing that God, or that uh, Bruce Wilkinson um, wrote a book about based on one obscure passage in the Old Testament. <clears throat> the question I have looking at the Prayer Jabez is this. Is this pattern of blessing where you pray a certain amount of times a day, asking in this particular way, is that a clear teaching throughout the rest of Scripture in order to get God's blessing? I would argue no. I would argue no. So then translate that over into Revelation. You know, when I'm looking at passages from a premillennial view, and I say, okay, this is kind of murky. Like, this is kind of murky. It's heavy in symbolism. Should I take this literally, or do I take into account what the teaching of the rest of Scripture is? And so this Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 and 8, where Satan comes back on the scene, where do you see that taught in the rest of Scripture? Like when you look at the passages about the end of time, what you see are passages that have finality to them. You don't see finality plus a thousand years, and then, oh, by the way, like Satan's coming back. The only place you jump to that conclusion is Revelation 20. So the question I have in my mind is this, and this again, this is a big part of why I'm not premillennial. Where do you see that taught? If we don't see that taught elsewhere in Scripture, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not correct. But at the very least, it should give us pause and 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 give us reason to say, hey, let's look at the rest of Scripture, see what the clear teaching is, and take that into account as we're formulating what uh, what we're convinced the view is. So that's the you know homework I would uh, push out to you guys as you look up the virgin birth thing as well is um, if you can show me in scripture where it clearly teaches that after this thousand year golden age where everything's all good that Satan and sin come back on the scene that might help move me back into as Pastor Jerry would call it the correct hand so. <laughs>